liquidity. Uh, so historically, Bitcoin has been one of the purest liquidity plays. So when you look at various measures of domestic or global liquidity, uh, when dealing with liquidity is rising, that's pretty good for Bitcoin. And when liquidity is falling, that's usually Bitcoin's usually either going down or sideways. And starting uh, around the beginning of Q4 uh, of last year, uh, some of the liquidity indicators started to bottom and turn back up, at least temporarily. Uh, and I think that, you know, much like other assets had a rally, I think Bitcoin would have had a rally back then, if not for the whole FTX uh, debacle. Uh, and so that kind of delayed the rally, but you know, with that somewhat resolved, uh, and now you know, kind of moving forward, I think, I think you know, Bitcoin and, and other aspects of the ecosystem are kind of having their rally, which is really a liquidity rally. Uh, and so, uh, you know, basically liquidity indicators still go okay for the next couple of months, but overall long-term, they're, they're still not in a very good place. The two largest cryptocurrencies by market value have each gained about 38% this year, spearheading a wider cryptocurrency market upsweep. A week ago, BTC was outpacing ETH by about 6 percentage points. The shift reflects a 1.4% rise in ETH's price and concurrent 3.1% drop in BTC. The change also comes as the Ether supply has tumbled by 17,800 year-to-date. Many investors view ETH as a deflationary asset that will weather upward price pressure better than other digital assets and traditional currencies. Hello and welcome to Crypto Street. In today's video, Lynn Alden updates about her outlook for Bitcoin in 2023. She also breaks down the importance of regulatory clarity in the space and how it will drive the future of institutional adoption in crypto. Yeah, so I, I kind of pointed that out as like something that no one should trade on that specific thing, but it's more like an observation. And that Part of the the underlying causation that you know correlation is that generally that's the two year the market kind of assessing that the Fed's getting close to being done its hiking cycle, uh, yeah, and so that that's kind of what happened last time where when the two year rolled over the Fed funds that ended up being the top of the hiking cycle and that ended up marking the the bottom of Bitcoin. Uh, yes, yeah, so right now I think we're seeing shades of that. It doesn't mean that it's the exact bottom. It doesn't mean that it's the bottom's guaranteed in. Uh, but I do think that the the part of the, the downward move uh, in Bitcoin that was specifically from the dollar rally, uh, I think that's kind of behind us. And now I think we probably have a longer grind ahead of us to, you know, kind of start rebuilding from here. But, uh, you know, I think when you look in the second half of this year, there's still some liquidity concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, and so kind of like how in the prior Bitcoin bear market, you had the major bottom in, say, you know, late 2018 and into 2019. That was the big bottom. But then you kind of had like a later liquidity shock through March 2020, where you went down and went up much faster. That was, that was again, another liquidity issue. Um, I, I would be surprised something like that, like a sharp retest, but it, it's too early to say because it, it partially depends on what humans do, what what <laughs> Jerome Powell does, what you know, what, what different policymakers do. And of course, that's always impossible to predict. So I think there's still big things like that that can move the, the crypto specific industry. Uh, but overall, like like historically, Bitcoin has been very correlated to macro factors and specifically liquidity. Uh, and I've looked at it over the past couple of years because a lot of people, they look at the halving cycle. that That's obviously got some of your correlation. But then if you look at, say, Bitcoin and the purchasing managers index, which is one of the leading like, you know, macro indicators, generally when it's rising, it means the economy is expanding. Uh, growth is growth is accelerating. Uh, when that's going down, growth is decelerating. It goes below 50. It, it's essentially outright contracting. And generally, Bitcoin is rather correlated with PMIs. Uh, it, it usually runs a little bit ahead of PMIs. Like it usually front runs it a little bit. And then I looked at it and saw that basically liquidity generally front runs PMIs. And Bitcoin tends to be very correlated with that liquidity. And so for the past three cycles or so, it, it's already been somewhat of a macro asset in, the, in that sense. But of course, if you have a big enough industry-specific blowout, uh, like you saw with 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 FTX and like you might see with some of these others, that can temporarily override the macro factors because you know it doesn't matter if liquidity is good if there's some massive force selling whale out there. The correlation between the two assets has continued to decline as well. While the correlation coefficient between BTC and ETH is usually above 0 0.90, it now sits at 0.41. Correlation coefficients range between 1 and minus 1, with the former implying a strong pricing relationship and the latter indicating an inverse one. Most of the indicators point that we are like early stage recession or late stage expansion. Uh, yeah, so a lot of leading indicators like, you know, uh, conference board lead leading indicators, purchasing managers indices, 
uh, those things are rolling over. Industrial production rolling over, uh, inflation-adjusted retail sales are rolling over. Uh, and the strong area, as you point out, has been the labor market. Uh, historically, that is a laggy or coincident indicator, meaning that by the time that by the time unemployment is rising, you're usually already in a recession. And that's part of the reason why those those two negative quarters weren't weren't kind of a full recession, is because unemployment was still uh, pretty low and not really worsening yet. Um, even in the labor market, though, we're starting to see that some of the early indicators there are not looking good. So, for example, if you look at uh, overtime hours, those are on the downtrend. If you look at temporary help, uh, that, that generally is a more volatile, leading uh, part of the overall labor force. Because imagine if you're a small business uh, and you're you're running into tight times, you know, you might reduce your temporary help service before you would let go of permanent employees. Uh, and so those are actually down year over year. Uh, and so basically there, there are multiple small signs that the labor market's cracking, uh, which combined with all the other indicators, inverted yield curve, uh, you know, uh, contracting PMI, it kind of points towards likely recession. Uh, but it, you know, I think we're, we're still in kind of the, either the pre-recession stage or, you know, they always declare a recession months after a bit, uh, it happens. So it's possible that this is like already part of the recession. But if, if it is, we, we, I think still really early, early stages. Yeah, so 2022 was a story of earnings multiple contraction. So it's not like earnings went down yet. Basically, you had, you had some non-energy earnings fall a little bit that was offset by energy earnings. So overall, that's about 500 earnings are, are currently fine. Uh, but you had a, because you had a sharp rise in, in interest rates, uh, you had a sharp reduction uh, in valuations. And and one you know simple way to think about it is if, if Usually the 10-year treasury is like the benchmark that you compare equities against, right? If, if you can get a 6% yield on a 10-year treasury, you might look at equities and say, I'm only going to invest if I can get 5% better than that, right? So I want 11% expected returns. They probably need to buy them pretty cheap if I want to if I want to comfortably beat the treasury. On the other hand, if the treasury is yielding 1% and I still want a 5% equity premium, I might buy equities even though I only anticipate that they're going to give me a 6% return. And therefore, I want to pay more, more like a higher earnings, multiple, lower dividend yields, things like that. And so, as you see the sharp rise, your zero yields all the way up to you know, well four percent at one point, that put a lot of downward pressure on equity valuations, especially growth oriented equities. And I think that part of the story is now largely behind us. And the question for twenty twenty three is: Are corporate earnings themselves going to be very weak? And I think that you know, I don't, I don't think they're going to collapse, but I do think that they're going to be weak. Investors should now watch whether the decreased correlation declines further or reverts to historic norms. Although with the spread recently evaporating, the latter is likelier to occur. And investors may also want to watch the net position change for ETH. An increased amount of Ether leaving centralized exchanges would signal that holders of the asset are less inclined to sell at the moment. As of February 2nd, investors were sending more ETH to exchanges than removing it, but that has since changed. Over time, yeah. So a lot of people are, have been surprised at how much the Fed's been able to tighten. Uh, somewhat me as well. Basically, if you would have asked me a year ago would I, would I think the Fed would get this high uh, this quickly, I would say no, probably not. Uh, but if you do it fast enough, you can, you can get away with it for periods of time. I mean, if, if, if the Fed just came out and said, you know, interest rates are 7% for one day tomorrow, it's not like all these, all these companies, uh, companies go bankrupt. It's about both the height of that interest and then it's also about the time spent at that interest level. And that's because a lot of debt is fixed rate. So homeowners have, you know, 30 year mortgages, corporations have five, 10 uh, longer uh, bonds. Uh, government also has a, a range of maturities averaging five or six years, but it ranges from, you know, almost instant to 30 years. Um, and so when they sharply raise interest rates, that only starts affecting the marginal debt that comes, you know, due and then gets refinanced. So if you just leave that interest rate where it is quarter after quarter, that starts to uh, impact more and more and more types of debt, even though you're no longer raising the interest rate. And of course, another factor to consider is, is not just the nominal rate, but also positive rates, right? So if you look at some emerging markets like Turkey, I mean, if you have, I don't, I don't have the numbers in front of me, let's say you had 80% inflation and you had 40% interest rates. Is that tight? Of course not, right? So that, that's very loose. So uh, a less extreme example is that if you have, you know, 7% inflation and you have 5% interest rates, are you are you tighter or are you loose? And the answer is that you're actually you're actually pretty loose. Uh, and so real yields uh, are still you know uh, negative in, in many ways of, of looking at it. Now the the challenge there is that there's multiple ways to measure real yields because CPI is apparently a lag indicator. It's backward looking, rates are forward looking, 
And it's, so it's hard to do that apples to apples comparison. So there's things like, you know, break evens, which are basically ways to measure the market's assessment of forward inflation. But then the problem there is that it's usually very inaccurate. They were not, they were not expecting inflation that we got in 2021, 2022. And so right now, overall, we're still not that tight relative to inflation. Although I think we're getting tighter as inflation comes down and as we stay at these tighter levels for, for longer. So what are your thoughts about Lynn Alden's prediction? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.